Two weeks ago, I started a series on what we here at Winston believe as we are going through some of these transitions, as we are welcoming new friends and new faces and new families into our midst. thought it was appropriate that we should take some time to review exactly what it is that we as a church believe, the things that we hold to, the things that we teach, and why it is that we teach them. So two weeks ago, I started where every good church should start, where every good church should be founded upon. That's God's holy and inerrant, infallible, inspired, and authoritative word. We talked about that two weeks ago as our foundation. Today, we're going to move forward, and for the next couple of weeks, I want to talk about something that we call essentials of our faith, essential beliefs. Those are the things that we believe that all Christians hold, or all Christians should hold to, beliefs always fall into one of two categories, what we call essential beliefs and those which we call non-essential beliefs. The essential beliefs are things that we would say you must believe if you are a Christian. By definition, a Christian believes certain things. If you don't believe these certain things, then you fall outside of that umbrella term, that family of Christian. So these are what we call essential beliefs. All Christians hold to these. And, and somebody who says, well, I'm a Christian and I don't hold to that belief is really revealing that they aren't a Christian to begin with. They may believe that they're a Christian, but if it's an essential belief to the Christian faith and they don't hold to it, it means that they aren't truly Christian. And I'm going to unpack that a little bit in just a minute. But I want to point out, first of all, two extremes that we're going to avoid or try to avoid as a church and in our sermon series. One of these extremes is that you have people who believe that everything that they teach is essential. Every single facet of every single doctrine that they hold to is essential. And if you don't believe it exactly as they articulate it, then you're not a Christian and you're going to hell. These are what we call extreme right fundamentalist Christians. Christians that believe that every doctrine that they teach, whether it be uh, the clothing that you wear, or the recipe that they use for the communion bread, or whether it be uh, doctrines on baptism, or whatever it happens to be, it, you must be baptized three times forward. No, 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 you got that backwards. You must be baptized three times backwards. No, you got that backwards. You must be baptized three times three times. And if you don't believe it the way that they teach it, they say, well, you're not in. You're not part of the in crowd. It's groups like this, when people make the joke about when you get to heaven and you're taking the tour around heaven and you see a big concrete block wall with no windows and a roof and they say, what's in there? And they say, well, that group is in there. They think they're the only ones in heaven. That's the sort of group that we're talking about. A group that feels that they've got everything exactly right and if you don't believe in every single thing that they teach, you're out. This is what we end up, what these people end up in cults or cult-like groups. We could say Jehovah's Witnesses kind of fall into this category, the Mormons, uh, Christian cults, and extreme fundamentalists. That's one extreme that we want to avoid. Everything that, that we believe must be believed exactly as we teach it. That's an extreme that we want to avoid. But on the other end of the spectrum, there's another side of this coin, another, another far end of the spectrum. And what we're talking about over here are the extremist sort of liberal theologians. Now, when I say liberal, I'm not talking about liberal politicians. I'm not talking about liberal economic views. I'm talking about liberal theologians. That's a very um, precise term. And there, where, where the extreme fundamentalists will say everything that we teach is essential to believe or else you're, you're not right with God, the extreme liberal theologian will say nothing that we teach is essential to believe. You can believe basically whatever you want to believe, and it's okay. And you've probably heard some phrases like, it doesn't matter what you believe, so long as you believe it and hold to it. Or you maybe have heard somebody say, all paths lead to the same end. All paths lead to God. All gods are essentially the same God expressed in different ways in different cultures. This is a liberal theological viewpoint. And this is an extreme other end of the spectrum that we have to avoid. We can't say that everything is essential, and we can't say that nothing is essential. There are essentials, but not everything is essential. Unless you think that this is something new that we just came up with in our day, Jesus addressed the same issue in his day. In his day, he had the Pharisees who said everything that we teach is essential, and they made up laws that protected them from breaking the laws, that protected them from breaking the laws that were in the Bible. 
This is called legalism. This is the, the people who say, you can't dance. Because if you dance, you may spark up some romantic feelings, some desirous feelings by watching the other people dance. And so that may lead to some lustful thoughts, which may lead to some lustful actions. So they put a rule in place to protect them from a rule to protect them from breaking God's law. Well, God's law never says don't dance. In fact, David dances with all his might before the ark. In his underwear. <coughs> so the, these people, these two are the Pharisees. The Pharisees came up and said, you can only walk so many steps on the Sabbath day. If you walk one more step, that's considered work. Legalists. Fundamentalists. Extremists. But on the other end of the coin, Jesus, another side of the spectrum, Jesus also dealt with a group of people called the Sadducees. And the Sadducees dismissed everything that was miraculous. They said, no, 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 the, the Bible says this, the Old Testament for them, the, the, the Torah says this. But we, we don't really believe that that happened. The Torah talks about angels, but angels are just figured it. The Torah talks about resurrection, but that, that's not really going to happen. And they dismissed all sorts of things. And they were on the other end of the spectrum. But they said, well, you don't really need to believe exactly everything that the Torah teaches. If you just believe it with a, a strong conviction, you're good to go. On this end of the spectrum today, we have groups like the Universalists who believe everybody's going to heaven, no matter what. Uh, mainline denominations are also falling into this sort of category where they believe everybody's okay, doesn't matter what you believe. Jesus dealt with it, we deal with it today. So the question that we're dealing with today in this past sermon is how do we avoid going to either one of these extremes? How do we hold to those things which are essential but not hold dogmatically to those things that are not essential? And how do you dis discern between the two? What is the distinction between those two and how do you make sure that you are doing both? Because holding to things that are not essential is as bad as not holding to things that are essential. And so I think one of the tools that we have in our arsenal since we've come to the Evangelical Presbyterian Church is the motto. The motto of the Evangelical Presbyterian Church, which we are now a part of, says this. In essentials, unity. In non-essentials, liberty. In all things, charity. If we just understand those three phrases and get that motto down, I think that will help us to maintain a good balanced view of the things that are essential, holding to them, holding loosely to the non-essentials and letting them go when necessary, and doing all things in love, which is another word for charity. So essentials, and essentials unity, these are the things that all Christians need to believe in order to be Christians. The question that I want to ask you, and I want to talk with you now for just a minute, is does the Bible teach that? Does the Bible actually say there are things that you must believe in order to be right with God? Does the Bible teach that there are essential doctrines that you have to hold to, that you have to believe, that you have to subscribe to in order to be saved and to go to heaven? I'd say yes, many places. And there's a few here that I want to just share with you. John 3.18, Jesus is speaking. If you have any doubt, it's Jesus himself. He says, whoever believes, that's a doctrine, that's an essential. Whoever believes in Jesus is not condemned. But whoever does not believe is condemned already. Because he has not believed in the name of the only Son of God. It's an essential. John 3.36, a little later in the same chapter, Jesus is still speaking with Nicodemus at night. Whoever believes in the Son of God has eternal life, and whoever does not Obey the Son, shall not see life, but the wrath of God remains on him. Jesus kind of contrasts here belief and disobedience. On one side you have belief, on the other side you have disobedience. What's the opposite of belief? What's the opposite of belief? No, disobedience. You see? Jesus says the opposite of belief is disobedience because in the Jewish mind, in the biblical teaching, belief always plays out in your actions. If you believe in God, your actions will show it. And so Jesus says, if you believe, then you will be saved. And if you disobey, you're condemned already. But that's the same thing as saying disbelief and belief are the opposite, and disobedience and obedience are the opposite, because the two are tied together perfectly. Mark 16, Jesus goes on, and he said to them, Go into all the world and proclaim the gospel to the whole creation. Whoever believes and is baptized will be saved. But whoever does not believe will be condemned. 
who have believed and is baptized will be saved. Whoever does not believe is already condemned. And then also in Acts 4, it says there's no salvation under any other name. There's essentials. Jesus, belief in Jesus is one of those essentials. Each of these passages affirms the fact that there is, there are essential beliefs that we as Christians must hold to in order to be called Christians. If we don't hold to them, we aren't Christians. You can claim to be a Christian all you want, but if you don't prescribe to the beliefs that the Bible says are essential and necessary for salvation, then you fall outside the category of Christian. What are some of these beliefs? That's what we're going to be talking about in the weeks to come. I don't want to start to unpack them today, but we will be talking about seven of those in the weeks to come. If you're curious and want a, a little bit of a sneak peek, look in your bulletins and you'll see what those seven are. But remember, we said that not all beliefs are essential. So those seven that we're going to be talking about are essential. We'll be talking about those, but some are not essential. These unessential and non-essential things are things that Christians can disagree on. Things that we can disagree about and, as the saying goes, agree to disagree agreeably. It says, the motto of the EPC says, in non-essentials, the things that aren't necessary to be Christians, we need to give freedom of belief. We need to allow people to come to their own conclusions. We need to allow people to draw their own ideas from the Bible in these things that are non-essential. Not in the essentials, in the non-essential things. The first question you should be asking is, does the Bible say that? Does the Bible say that we're allowed to disagree on some doctrinal ideas, some uh, beliefs? Well, Paul addresses this, and he addresses two specific areas that are non-essentials to salvation. The first has to do with the dietary restrictions, and the second has to do with the day of worship. What day worship should take place? Some believe that worship should take place on Sunday. Some people believe that. Some people believe that worship should only take place on Saturday. Some people believe it doesn't matter what day you worship, so long as you observe a weekly Sabbath. What does Paul say about this? Romans 4, 1. As for the one who is weak in faith, well, wait, weak in faith, welcome him, but do not quarrel over opinions. See, non-essentials. One person believes he may eat anything, while the weak person only eats vegetables. Let not the one who eats despise the one who abstains, and let not the one who abstains pass judgment on the one who eats, for God has welcomed him. What Paul is saying is that whether you want to follow the dietary restrictions of the Old Testament or not is a non-essential. There's nothing wrong with following it so long as you don't think that's what's saving you. There's nothing wrong with eating according to the Bible's dietary uh, standards. In fact, there may be some positive benefits of that. But he says it's not an essential. And so Christians can disagree on that. He goes on in verse 4. Uh, who are you to pass judgment on another man's servant? It is before his own master that he stands or falls. And he will be upheld, for the Lord is able to make him stand. And now he talks about the worship, days of worship. One person esteems one day as better than another, while another esteems all days alike. Each should be fully convinced in his own mind. The one who observes the day, observes it in honor of the Lord. The one who eats, eats in honor of the Lord, since he, has, <clears throat> since he, has, since he gives thanks to the Lord, while the one who abstains, abstains to honor the Lord, and give thanks to the Lord. Do you see what Paul is saying? Whether you worship God on Sunday, or Saturday, or Friday, or Wednesday, if you have a Sabbath day of rest that is dedicated to the Lord, you are obeying His command to remember the Sabbath and keep it holy. If you are gathering together with other believers. In Muslim nations, it is dangerous for new converts to meet on Sunday morning. It could be deadly. They worship on Friday night, just like all other Muslims worship on Friday night, so that they can blend in with their culture a little bit and not be killed for converting to the faith. At least not at first. Because they're continuing the tradition of worshiping God on Friday. And in fact, that works out better because their day of rest is Friday. So a lot of times people have off on Friday. So for Muslims, worshiping on Friday is probably the best option in Muslim countries. For Jews who convert and become Messianic, Saturday 
is a great day because other Jews are worshiping on Saturday. Paul goes on a little later in Romans 14, explains why these are not essentials. 14 verse 17, for the kingdom of God is not a matter of eating and drinking, but of righteousness and peace and joy in the Holy Spirit. He says these things are not essentials. Do not hold to them as essentials. What is essential is a life of righteousness being filled with the Holy Spirit. Jesus also talks about this when the Pharisees come to him and they say, why do your disciples not walk according to the traditions of the elders, but they eat with defiled hands? What the, what the Pharisees are saying is, why don't they wash their hands before they eat? Is it a good idea to wash our hands before we eat? Moms? Yes, it is. Is it something that if we don't do it, we're going to burn in hell? No. Is it something that is morally has moral implications? No. It's a good idea. So those who do it are okay. And those who don't, well, they may get sick. But that's on their own shoulders. But it's not an essential if you want to say it's important, yes, that's fine. But you cannot say this is an essential to our faith. And that's what, that's what Jesus ends up saying. He says to them, you hypocrites, isn't it, don't you know that it is written, people honor me with their lips, but their heart is far from me. In vain do they worship me, teaching as doctrines the commandments of men. He's saying you're making the commandments of men, the traditions of men, more important than the commandments of God. He says you leave God's commandments to follow men's Commandments. You focus so much on the non-essentials, making them essential, that you forget what the essentials are. So there's lots of non-essentials, and I want to just give you a couple of those because we won't be talking about those in the weeks to come. Things that are not 100% clear in the Scripture, and certainly not necessary for salvation since they aren't clear. So what sorts of things are non-essential? Well, how often should we take communion? Some people take it weekly. Some people take it daily. Some people take it monthly or quarterly. Some people take it annually. How often we take it is a non-essential. Should we baptize infants or should we baptize only those who are old enough to profess faith in Jesus Christ? There are faithful, Bible-believing Christians on both sides of this uh, uh, viewpoint. And they will both use the Bible to support their view. Do we believe that? Um, um, do you believe in predestination, or do you believe in free will? If I ask for a show of hands, I bet you we have about a 50-50 split in the room. People who believe in God's foreordaining of salvation, and people who believe that it's completely up to the person. And then we've got a long discussion, and then next week we'd still be about 50-50 because we're not going to convince each other because we both have Bible passages to, to support that viewpoint. It's a non-essential. That's not something that you have to believe in one way or the other to be saved. You have to believe in Jesus. That's an essential. But you don't have to believe in how you believe, how you come into that. Faith is not an essential. Whether God moves you into that faith or whether you move into it and God empowers you. But you have to believe in the essentials, not the non-essentials. How about the end times? There's a big non-essential. If we start to talk about rapture and those sorts of things, who believes that people are going to be raptured before a great tribulation? Who, you know, we could go on and talk about all sorts of different things. Should women be ordained to serve as pastors and elders or not? Should we recite creeds during worship service or not? Should we have pictures of Jesus and pictures from the Bible events or not? There are people that believe both sides of these things and people who will cite passages of Scripture to support them. In any case, there are some things that are essential and some things that are not essential. And what the EPC motto says is in the essentials we are united. In the non-essentials we are free to come to our own decision. And then final, the final piece of the motto says in all things charity. That means when you come to somebody who disagrees with you on one of those non-essentials, you don't slap them in the face and spit in their eye. You love them. Charity is just another word for love. In all things, charity, whether you disagree with the non-essential or not. In fact, if somebody comes up to you and they disagree with an essential, guess what? You are still to love them, but your love will be expressed in a very different way. Your love to somebody who doesn't agree with an essential will be to help them to see that what they are disagreeing with is an essential, that it is something that is necessary to be saved in faith, through faith in Jesus. And this, I would say, this third part of the motto, in all things charity, in all things love, is perhaps the easiest to support biblically. 
And I just want to read a few verses here for you. Uh, all from the Gospel of John or John's first letter. Jesus is speaking. He says, A new commandment I give you that you love one another just as I have loved you. You also are to love one another. By this, all people will know that you are my disciples if you have love for one another. John 15, this is my commandment that you love one another as I have loved you. John 15 again a little later. These things I command you so that you love one another. The Apostle John teaches us this in his letter. And this is God's command that we believe in the name of His Son, Jesus Christ, and love one another, just as He commanded us. John 3, 1 John 3, 6, uh, excuse me, 11. For this is the message that you have heard from the beginning, that we should love one another. 1 John 4, and this is the command we have for you. Whoever loves God must also love his brother. You get the picture. We are to love each other. And that's the third part of that motto. So whether you're disagreeing or agreeing, we are called to express that disagreement or that agreement in love. And that plays out very differently in a situation. But in all situations, we are to love one another. So why did I want to talk to you about the EPC motto? Why did I want that to introduce our discussion on these essentials that we'll be talking about in the coming weeks? Because I think it is a healthy model to help us maintain that balance and not slide too far to the right or to the left, too far into any one area where we're holding all things as essential or disregarding the essentials and holding nothing or too few things as essential. I believe that keeping this motto at the back of our mind or in the forefront of our mind will help us to keep that balance, maintain that balance, and discern those things that are essential and admit those things that aren't essential. There are things that we here as a church will expect. If you, are, if you want to be a member of this church, you will be examined by the session, and we will expect to see certain things in your statement of faith. We will expect you to hold to certain doctrines, and if you don't, bless you, you are welcome to join us for worship. You are welcome to sit in on the Sunday school classes. If you disagree with some of the things that are essential, we're glad that you're here. But we won't make you a member. Because to be a member means that you hold to those essentials. We're glad that you're here. But membership is not for you. No matter what you believe, come and worship and learn more about God. So remember the motto. In essentials, Unity. In non-essentials, liberty. In all things, charity. This is what the man we have received from God, and this is why we follow it. Let's pray. Father, we want to thank you that you have given us your word, that your word teaches us many things, and that some of those things are necessary for salvation. Thank you for making that clear. Help us in the coming weeks to really identify those things strongly and clearly so that we can hold to them. And if there's somebody here who doesn't believe in them, convict them, Holy Spirit. Bring their hearts light and understanding as to why it's essential and why it's so important and why it's so necessary. So Father, we ask your blessing on these and we pray this all in Jesus' name. Amen. I want to invite you to stand and sing our closing hymn for the benediction. We'll just be singing the first and the last verses of hymn number 439. In Christ there is no east and west. Please stand for the benediction.